Hi, everybody. I'm Emma, and we're going to get started our fall webinar. Um, this month, we're tackling books, and Rena's here to work on that with me. So I'm Emma. Backlog is my little company. Um, I'm an archival consultant. Um, in the past, we've had a couple of high schools in town as clients, the Carnlet Historical Society, and then also a newer client is the Walt Disney Hometown Museum out in Marceline, Missouri. Um, before I got into this, kind of doing my own thing, I worked as an archivist at Maryville University for five years. And before that, I worked in, in history and genealogy reference out at the St. Louis County Library. Hi, I'm Rena Shergan. Uh, I've been working at the Catholic Archdiocese of St. Louis Archives for just over nine years. Uh, prior to that, I worked um, in the University of Chicago Special Collections for several years while I pursued my master at University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And I've known Emma for several years now, and I just started working with her this year. So just a little bit about backlog. Um, we do a lot of genealogy research, a lot of space genealogy research. Um, we've done some family digital archives this year, which includes scanning like boxes and boxes of family items and then putting them into a digital archive that can be accessed online by all of your family. And then recently we've been doing oral histories and putting together family books. And then last and definitely not least, um, we do institutional archives. So we work with small archives and museums to set policies and procedures. To, to do some training, just to kind of um, kind of elevate what volunteers are already doing. So these are this is some examples of projects we've done. On the left hand side, we have a couple of personal family archive projects. So we scanned a bunch of photographs and we upload them to um, a program I like called permanent.org and it's funded by an endowment so hopefully it'll be around long after we're gone and then on the right hand side um, that's me with my volunteer team over at St. Louis University High School they're an ongoing client and I work with them and then at the bottom that is a German I think it was a baptismal certificate and we did a translation of that. So we can do some French and German translations of forms like that if you have them in your family collection. But we'll go ahead and get going with today's webinar and Raina, I'll let you take it away. All right. So in your personal collections, you may have many examples of books or other bound items that are important to your family history or have special sentimental value. These can include printed books, diaries, account books, albums, family Bibles, or scrapbooks. While each of these have different content, they all have a similar structure and preservation guidelines. Today, we're gonna to discuss some of the factors that contribute to the deterioration and damage of your bound up volumes and how you can mitigate further damage through basic preservation, handling, and storage. Next slide, please. The origins of books can be traced all the way back to the ancient Sumerians in 3500 BCE, and they carved cuneiform symbols into clay tablets and fired them in a kiln. This was the first example of portable text. The first paper-like material was papyrus, which was developed in Egypt around 3000 BCE, which was rolled into a scroll. And papyrus paved the way for text to be stored in a very lightweight form, certainly much lighter than clay tablets. If we fast forward to the Romans in the first and second century common era, we see that the we see that there's a clear development of bound books from paper or parchment, which was something that was made of animal skin. Even more versatile than scrolls. Books were a revolutionary way to transport lots of information in a form that was relatively light and small. Jumping again to the year 1440, Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press, which allowed for many copies of a single text to be produced from one machine. 
This quickly replaced the laborious process of monks transcribing one word at a time from one manuscript to another. The printing press was an instrumental turning point in the history of the world as we know it. Books could be distributed more widely and cheaply, allowing common people to become literate and participate in reading, interpreting, and sharing ideas. Without this development, we likely wouldn't be sitting here right now sharing information. Next slide, please. It's useful to know the basic parts in the physical structure of the books before we get started. So the text block is comprised of groupings of pages that are called gatherings or signatures. Traditionally, these were folded or stacked and then sewn together down the spine. In the early 20th century, century we largely moved to glue-based processes, even for hardback books. You can tell whether you have a sewn or glued binding by opening your book, looking at that middle signature of the book. And if it's sewn, you'll actually be able to see the threads that connect the signatures. Mm. And the cover itself is made of the front and backboards and the spine all together. So in this picture, it's that orange covering there. And that holds the whole book together. The binding refers to the cloth or the leather that covers and holds together the boards and the text block. If there's a paper cover around your book, this extra piece is called a dust jacket, and this is that removable piece. The head is at the top of the book. The tail is at the bottom of the book. The foredge is opposite of the spine. Um, and you'll often find a, an end band at the head and tail, which is a little piece that's made out of colored threads. Traditionally, the end band served a functional purpose and actually supported the entire binding in the spine. But in a lot of 20th century books, it's actually just a decorative element. So this book here is sewn but that end band, so it's a little red thread strip across the back there, um, that is just glued in. So it's purely ornamental. When you open the book, the hinge and the joint attach the boards to the text block. Inside, you'll find that the first couple pages uh, in the front and back are blank or they have a decorative pattern on them. And those are called end papers. They're actually an additional way that the boards are attached to the text block itself. Paperback books, um, so not one like the one we're seeing here, are simply glued. So the text block is just glued to the spine. There's no sewing involved. And because they're only glued, they will fall apart easier than sewn books like this one will. Next slide, please. So what are the common causes of damage to your books? UV light, temperature, and humidity are some environmental factors that can greatly affect the preservation of your books. You want to avoid storing your books in direct sunlight, which can bleach out the color and weaken the binding. Wherever you store your books, try to keep them in a place where the temperature and humidity are relatively consistent and comfortable to the human body. So very dry environments, whether those are hot or cold, are detrimental to materials. But worst of all, the fluctuation in temperature and humidity causes the most damage to items. So humidity and heat causes molecules to expand and dry cool temperatures cause them to contract. So when you have this back and forth process occurring, it compromises the molecular structure of the item and causes it to be to warp or to become brittle. You wanna keep your books in clean spaces that don't attract insects. So silverfish, book lice, and book worms, yes, they are real. Uh, they love to eat the starch-based glue that you find on spines. And lastly, um, if you want to ensure 
um, proper preservation of your books. You wanna make sure that you're properly storing and handling your books and not causing more damage to them. Next slide. So let's talk about how we can handle our books. When you take a book off the shelf, you should grab it by the two sides of the spine. So sometimes this means you need to push back the books that are right next to it on either side so that you can grab at that spine. You don't wanna pull on the top of your book because if it's a bound book, you're going to damage the end cap on the top of the book. And if, um, if you're pulling on it, you can also put stress on the spine and you don't want that piece to rip off. If it's a heavy volume, you wanna be sure that you're handling it with both hands and you're distributing that weight evenly. Be careful when you're turning pages, especially if the pages are brittle or the book is oversized. Instead of turning the pages by the edges, you want to make it, try to make it a practice to insert your whole hand behind the page and then move the whole page with your hand. So you're supporting the entire page as you turn it. Especially, this is especially the case for large books. And in those cases, you might actually want to use two hands to turn the entire page of that book. If you have uh, books that are particularly fragile, you might wanna invest in a book cradle. That's what's seen here in this picture or a book support. So this can relieve stress on the spine when you open and use the book so that you're not opening it completely flat. You're still giving that spine support and it's being attached to the boards without putting stress on it. Next page, please. If you have a collection of books, anything average sized can be stored upright on a shelf. You want to use a bookend to ensure that the volumes are erect and they're supporting each other. You don't want the book to slouch or to sit vertically because this is going to warp the spine and the text block. If you're storing differently sized books together, you should really arrange them by size so that they can properly support one another on the shelf. So for example, if you have a really tall book, it's not going to be supported by placing a little short book next to it. That tall book is going to become top heavy and push over that small book. If you only have a handful of volumes or you have books that are in really poor condition, you may wanna consider storing them with your other family papers in an acid-free folder and box. So you can just label the folder with the title or description of the item. And if you do this, you wanna be sure um, that you store the book with its spine facing down. It's our instinct to have the spine facing up so we can see what's written on the spine. But if you do that, it actually, the weight of the book the text block pulls at the spine and it can separate from the spine. So you can actually cause more damage to it, just gravity, just by gravity. Um, if you have a really big book uh, that has a large cover or maybe a really fat text block, uh, you can store it flat on the shelf. If the book um, hangs over the edge of the shelf, you might wanna find a different storage location just because it might be a little easy to bump into it and again, cause further damage to it. Next slide, please. The most uh, common issues that you're gonna face with damaged books are brittle or cracking pages, which are often caused by the acidification of the paper torn pages caused by mishandling, a weakened or broken spine, which can lead to loose pages, or cover boards or a binding that are tearing or cracking. Uh, first off, you never want to use post-its, tape, glue, staples, or paper clips on your books. Each of these can have long-term preservation issues, including st staining, acidification or rusting. Um, and just to clarify, acidification is the degradation process where paper becomes acidic. 
And you'll often see that when your paper is becoming yellow or brownish and brittle, this is the acidification process at work. Um, and the process can be accelerated by environmental factors like temperature and humidity fluctuations and pollution. If your book has a loose cover or spine, you can use unble unbleached cotton tape to tie it around and hold everything together. This isn't like sticky scotch tape. This is actually woven cotton string that's flat. Um, and when you tie it, you want to make sure that your tie is on the spine or the fore edge of the book. If you keep the tie on the front or back cover of the book and you have the book wedged between other books, it can actually cause an indentation in the cover. So if you're tying a book, you want to make sure it's at the front or back or the, the fore edge or the spine of the book. If your book is missing a cover, um, a, an easy way to take care of that would be, and still protect that text block underneath, is to cut a piece of acid-free cardboard to size and just lay it on the text block. And then you can tie that whole book with string. And that way you're keeping every, you're supporting that text block and protecting it from the elements. Um, you can also look at getting your book rebound uh, by a book binder or a conservator. Next slide, please. One way that you can provide extra protection for your books is to store them in acid-free folders and boxes, as I talked about earlier. Remember that you want to place the book's spine down in the folder. You can also individually encase the books like is seen here. So these are, um, well, these are called phase boxes. They fit the books perfectly. I mean, they fit like a glove on the books. And then we tie them with strings so that we have a little bit of extra protection around the whole volume. Um, and these are made from acid-free cardboard. You can also use, um, you can also wrap your books just like Christmas presents using um, alkaline or bond paper and then again tying them with that cotton tape so that's another option it's a cheaper option next slide please oh wait yes that's correct <laughs> we're on the right slide um, if you have a particularly sentimental or important book that's in bad condition and you'd like to restore it you should really contact a conservator so a conservator is trained in repair, and so they would be able to do things like creating a new cover, um, mending torn pages, re-sewing the spine of the book, removing sc sticky scotch tape from your book or from the pages. Um, they might be able to help with acidification of the pages of your book as well. If you have a book that's exhibiting red rot, you'll definitely want to contact a conservator. So red rot describes the degradation process of leather. Um, the leather decays into an red or orange powder that can stain paper and textiles. The book that you're seeing pictured here is, um, is wrapped in leather and that yellow part is it's just a yellow dust at this point. Anytime we handle the book, we have to be very careful because it leaves residue everywhere. Um, so the, the deterioration of leather is caused by exposure to high humidity and temperature. And this reacts with the residual chemicals that are in the leather uh, that were applied during the original tanning process. Uh, red rot is irreversible. It can't be undone. Um, there are sealers that you can buy um, that can slow down or contain the degradation process, but these aren't really considered conservator friendly. Um, so you might want to contact a conservator about whether that's right for your situation. Um, Conservators can also create a new cover for your book um, or a book binder can create a new cover for your book to replace that degrading leather cover. If you're handling any books with red rot, 
uh, you'll want to be sure to wash your hands immediately after handling the book, including before you even touch the pages of that book, because it, it will stain paper and it'll stain your clothes too. So uh, be careful. This is also a good case in which to wrap the volume um, if you're unable to replace the cover um, so that you're not getting that residue everywhere. Uh, next page, scrapbooks. So scrapbooks are really challenging items to deal with because they usually contain all sorts of materials inside um, like paper, plastic, foil, ribbon, photographs, you name it. Uh, so sometimes the adhesives that were used in scrapbooks no longer stick and items fall out. And unfortunately, there's not much you can do about this um, to make it as it once was, but there are some important steps that you can take to mitigate its deterioration and capture its contents. So scrapbooks tend to be large and they have lots of materials inside that can become loose and slip out. For this reason, you will wanna store the scrapbook flat. You should consider purchasing an acid-free box that'll fit the scrapbook well, like the one you're seeing in this picture. A next best option would be to wrap the book in alkaline paper or acid-free paper and tie it with unbleached cotton tape. Because items often loosen and fall out of scrapbooks, it's highly encouraged that you take images of the scrapbook. Photograph each page and keep a separate physical or digital copy of it. The copies can serve as an access copy so that you don't have to continuously handle the scrapbook, which will cause further damage to the item, like items falling out or pages chipping at the edges. You don't really want to try to re-glue or tape or staple items back in because all of those things, glue, tape, and staples can have long-term effects that can further deteriorate the album. So if items fall out and you don't want to necessarily keep them inside of the scrapbook itself, you can remove them and put them in an envelope that's stored with the scrapbook. And then those access copies that you took of the pages will tell you exactly how those original items were placed inside of the album itself. All right, next slide. So, well, that was everything. Um, everything that I discussed were just some of the basic considerations and steps that you can take to protect your books and ensure that they're preserved well into the future. So at this time, I can uh, take specific questions or I don't know if Emma, you wanted to say or add anything. So we'll do questions right now, but just so everybody knows our next, our next webinar will be on AV materials. So, you know, old film, you know, Super 8 film, even vinyl records fall under this, even though I think the preservation, I'm reading a lot of things that were written like about 15 years ago on vinyl preservation before it got popular again. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, so we'll cover that in December. Um, and that will be our final fall preservation webinar. And all of these are available on YouTube. And to register for that, you just go to our website, but I will also send out an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this and then also to the registration for December's. But right now, does anybody have any questions about books, book preservation? Yes, hi, Emma, it's KJ Rink here. How are you? Good. Nice to see you guys. Um, it's been very interesting. Um, handling, handling the pages, I uh, actually, actually when I was at Maryville, there was only one woman who handled the, the, um, I want the elementary education program and um, she, but she, 
I was failing almost every subject with her. Uh, but anyway, the point is, is that she was adamant about how to handle the pages, which is yours is a lot more delicate, you know, using your whole hand to turn the entire page. Um, but she had suggested you start at the up, up you start at the upper right hand corner and then bring your hand down and then turn it over that way. Does that I I don't know if it I don't know that it would necessarily matter which corner you start with, but I mean certainly I mean, so I was talking about, especially about books that are fragile, you know, you definitely right. want to be careful, but obviously if you have brittle corners, you, you want to be even more careful, right. right? So, I mean, if you have damage in the top corner, then, you know, start from the bottom, but I don't know that it would necessarily matter which corner you start with as long yeah. as yeah. you are, you know, really getting your whole hand under the page. Um, yeah. But I, yeah. I probably, you know, ergonomically, like the body just probably naturally goes from the top, you know, from the yeah. top down. So, I mean, it might, it might make sense yeah. in that way. And, and unless we're, you know, left-handed or. Yeah, sure. <laughs> from a different cultural background, you know, from left to right. Um, I have another question about the use of gloves and I've been, seeing some different television shows um you know one that's up your alley and you probably know who I mean it's uh Henry Louis Gates uh I think I have those names in the right order you know uh finding your roots etc mm -hmm, yeah it's just, it's, very often you'll see some some people um who are experts in handling like ancient material I mean you know like from not going back to you know 1400 common era but um i'm going to talk like about the revolution uh, our uh, the our american revolution from the 1700s um they'll be they'll be seeing you know be seeing stuff like that and sometimes i see people wearing gloves and some people sometimes i see people handling documents that are like go back to like henry the eighth and elizabeth and they're just, they're not, they're not wearing anything. And I'm freaking out being, you know, the Virgo <laughs> that I am. So um, anyway, I wanted your take on that. Yeah. So gloves is a common question that we get in archives specifically. So if you're high, if you're handling three-dimensional items, like in museums, a lot of folks are going to use gloves to handle those. When it comes to paper, it's a little bit of a different animal. So paper if so when you're looking at paper that was um that was made in the 1700s so like before like the mid 1800s before the industrial revolution yeah the paper had a lot more cotton content in it and it's oh. way sturdier than the paper that was made you know after the mid 19th century and forward and so the in general, that paper, the older paper is actually sturdier. We have documents in here in our in the archives at the archdiocese that um, where the paper is faring better from the early 1800s than the paper from the 1930s. Yeah. So huh. when you uh, we don't use gloves to handle the paper here, and the reason being is that if you're wearing gloves you can't feel paper between your fingers and you're actually more likely to rip it. So especially when you're talking uh, about brittle oh, paper. Yeah. So if you're looking, however, at books um, where the pages were made out of parchment, so animal skin, yeah. they are really, really sturdy. I don't know if you've ever felt parchment, but it's, no, it's thick. Yeah. Yeah. And so you can, you can wear gloves and you also have ink, lots of ink and paint on those kinds of pages on those manuscript pages. Right. So in a lot of cases, um, they'll, uh, special collections will use gloves yeah. to handle those books. Now, I mean, it also just depends on the repository itself. So, you know, I went to, um, I worked at the University of Chicago Special Collections 
And they had a very strong um, view that manuscripts were meant to be touched by people. So that there is a whole host of information that you can get just by feeling the page, feeling the indentations of the pens, feeling you know how the paint is raised on the page. Um, so they only in very special circumstances would they ask researchers to wear gloves. So all that said, <laughs> there's yeah. lots of different ways right, that repositories right. yeah. do things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but when you're dealing with the regular kind of paper that we're used to dealing with in our day and age, I would say don't use gloves because again, you're more likely to rip the page. However, you can, you know, yeah. always make it a practice to wash your hands before you're touching anything valuable um, or something that you want to last a long time because those oils in your fingers um, can, you know, or if you've got, well, I know you're not probably eating Cheetos and then, you know, handling your records, but, you know, well, you, whatever you're you doing, school, you know, putting yeah. your hands through your hair, getting hair gel on it or whatever, you know, you just <laughs> want to make sure everything's off your hands before you're handling any of your special items. So that it's was fun. the long answer about gloves. <laughs> no, no, it's very informative. Very, very, very informative. I'm I appreciate your help. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Signing and, off here. Excuse me. Oh, and KJ, um, with, yeah. uh, with the gloves on those shows, it can be a little performative. Yeah. So it, it was, so it seems like super special. And, um, and there's even a meme that goes around like archive circles. That's like, should you wear gloves in the archives? Well, are you Mickey Mouse? <laughs> Just to kind of tease it because it's so common to see on shows, right? And it's, and it's just like not actual practice, but it makes it, you know, like it's that white glove treatment, literally, that makes it look better on the show. Right. I it's know exactly ad, what you're talking about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's inconsistent on some shows like Lucy Worsley, who's a Brit uh, historian that does, you know, Lucy Worsley does Jane Austen or, you know, she, she's PBS. And um, it's just kind of like history, less than 101, um, in my opinion. Anyway, but she she's um she's hand, I've seen her handle stuff, and then I've seen was she's with somebody where they're wearing gloves. So, um, but they're they're looking at stuff from all over the place. But some of those older things that would be interesting. Oh, yeah. Also, just a just a thought about being in the archdiocese, um, um, you know, behind so much red tape, uh, which is where the the secrets are in the Vatican's where the, you know, under the red tape or anyway, that's totally a non sequitur. I just was thinking of archival material from the church point of view. Anyway, thank you. Appreciate everybody's time. Didn't mean to take up so much. Yeah, no problem. That was a good question. Yeah. Rena, is there a question in the chat? I can't see it since I'm screen. Yes. Yeah. So Brittany asked, uh, what were the storage materials called that fit the books like gloves and can be tied with the woven cotton string? So we call those phase boxes. So like a phase of life, phase boxes. Um, and you can pre-purchase these from archival supply companies so that you have the exact dimensions um, or you can make your own. So you can purchase the cardboard and make your own. Um, the ones that I showed you, I made out of used acid-free folders, actually. So um, that was a way I tried to reuse some old materials that we had. Um, and yes, and then, yeah, they're called phase boxes. No yeah, problem. This is, this is Seashore. Um, I have a question also related to wrapping boxes. And um, we have several fragile books that just to protect them, I didn't use those boxes, but I do have acid-free paper, a thick acid-free paper that I've um, wrapped them up in, but is there an advantage or is there a reason since you're using acid-free paper and not, not touching the book itself, um, that you shouldn't use tape instead of wrapping with with yards and yards and yards of twill tape. Um, Do you mean scotch tape? 
Yeah, yeah. On the outside, you know, once you've wrapped it, is there a reason not to use tape because you're not touching the book at all anymore? Yeah, I guess, um, well, over a long period of time that scotch tape, the that sticky, the stickiness of scotch tape has all sorts of chemicals in it that will bleed into that paper covering. So um, when, so if you're, are you just covering, are you making like a dust jacket cover out of the, no, I'm wrapping the them up. you're wrapping it up like a Christmas present. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would say you just wanna be aware that, you know, that sticky residue will eventually bleed through the paper. It will, you know, it'll eventually go to the other side of that paper that you have wrapping it. Um, so it would be something that in the future, um, if you are using scotch tape, it's, you know, it's that you check it in the future. Like you check the other side to make sure that it's, you know, it's not bleeding through. Mm -hmm. And the other thing would be, I mean, if you are looking to open that book and see the book, you're gonna have to tear the scotch tape away or it might tear the paper. That would just be another consideration I would have. Um, we try not to use things like scotch tape, you know, in the archives just because it can have long-term effects. And we're trying to do as little as possible on the front end so that we don't have to go back and recheck everything. Um, so that would be the reason for using the string for us. Um, but if it's something that you think you can go back to, you know, periodically to make sure it's looking okay, then you could, I mean, you could use it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And, and with the encasements or the phase boxes, they're pretty, they're pretty easy to open and get the book back out of. And so it's still about, it's, so it allows for a certain level of access where you'd have to unwrap the book because archival materials are meant to be used, not super right. often, but they are there as reference materials. So that's the, that's the advantage to what Rena showed in the presentation. Cause usually you have the string or I've seen them that had like little dots of Velcro and those are way more expensive. But it's just like, it's just for ease of access, you know, the one time in one decade that the book is used. Right. So, okay. So you bring up another question then about those little dots of Velcro because um, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a seamstress, so I'm the queen of Velcro, but um, uh, sticky Velcro has an adhesive on the back as well. Correct. So, so do they make Velcro that... Um, has special stickiness that that doesn't harm things? No, it would just be that the Velcro is being used on thicker cardboard. Oh, okay. So it's not going to bleed. I mean, eventually in, you know, decades years. and decades and yeah. decades, it will, <laughs> or most likely it'll just fall off before it actually bleeds through the thick cardboard. But yeah, right. so that would be the difference there. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions while we're here tonight? Those were some really good questions. They too. really were. <laughs> yeah, the the glove one and then the how to you know wrap the book. Those are pretty common. Those were good. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're gonna wrap it up here tonight. Um, I will send everybody an email with a link to the presentation and then a link to register for next month. But thank you so much for coming and joining us tonight. Thank you. It was most enjoyable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure. Bye -bye. You too. Have a good one. See ya. Well.